a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening once again to you, depending on the time zone that you are in. My name is Ohimo Godwin Pius, and I want to welcome you to our Antimicrobial Resistance Symposium put together by the Global Health Network Nigeria and the Global Health Network General. It is indeed an honor for us to have you connect with us this morning for the symposium that we have, uh, we have organized as we join the world and also the uh, World Health Organization in the Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week celebration. So today we have a lot of wonderful individuals on our panel who will be sharing their thoughts, their research with us on the subject matter of AMR. But before we start, I'd like to uh, run through some housekeeping for you and for every one of us on this call so that we know what we are expected to do. First off, this uh, webinar is being recorded uh, and we are recording it because we'd like to share it on the Global Health Network um, website. Now, due to the number of participants on the call, your camera and microphones are disabled. Uh, we advise that you use the chat feature for any technical issues that you might have. I have a lot of persons who are actually uh, asking questions whether the webinar is being recorded. Of course, yes, the webinar is being recorded and it will be made available uh, for, for you to review in the nearest future. You can also use the Q&A feature to post your questions if you have any, and you can choose to post anonymously. Uh, we have we have dedicated time for Q and A. So at the end of the presentation, from each speaker, um, you'll be um, given the chance to ask your question, and the resource persons will uh, will be very very happy to jump in and to give answers to whatever question that you might have. So um, first, I would also like to um, introduce the member of the panel today to you. I am Ohemu Godwin Pius. I am the hub and media um, coordinator of the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center. I also work as the graduate assistant at the Antimicrobial Resistance Knowledge Hub of the Global Health Network. Uh, our speakers for today, uh, first we have um, Solomon Olorunleke, he's a lecturer with the Department of Animal Science at Ebony State University, and he's also the AMR program manager of Drasa Health Trust. We also have um, Dr. Seniat Afeboa from the Department of Microbiology at Madibelo University. So these are the resource persons that we have. And then with me on the call today are uh, my incredible teammates. I have the, um, the African Regional Coordinator of the Global Health Network. Her name is Christine Kirima. She's going to uh, make her presentation as we proceed. I also have the coordinator of the Antimicrobial Resistance Knowledge Hub of the Global Health Network, Dr. Ryan Walker, who is also on the call with us today. And then I have my excellent teammate, Louis, who is the media coordinator of the network, also on the call um, with us today. So a quick run through of the agenda, as you can see um, on your screen, we have welcome and housekeeping, opening remark on behalf of the Global Health Network African region. Uh, we'll have a quick overview of the Global Health Network AMR Knowledge Hub and community of practice, then we'll take session one presentation, session two, then we'll make announcement about the launch of the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center, and then we'll take a closing remark. So having said that, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor to have you on this call with us today. We are very, very glad, and as you can see, we are on our blue shirt, and we really can't wait to go blue for AMR. We are trying to increase awareness and to enlighten the general public on what they need to know so that they can make informed decisions as for how to use antimicrobials prudently. So you are welcome. Uh, we are happy you can use the chat box, as, uh, as I said, to introduce yourself and get to meet each other. So the first thing on our agenda is the opening remark on behalf of the Global Health Network African region, and this will be given by my excellent colleague, uh, colleague Christine Kirima. Christine, if you are ready, I am ready, we are ready, and over to you, Christine. Thank you so much, Godwin. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. I really do feel as though I've also been welcomed to this symposium. So thank you for taking lead on that. I will be, well, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you very warmly to this virtual symposium celebrating this year's World AMR Awareness Week. My name is Kristen Kerima, as Godwin put it. I am the Africa Regional Coordinator at the Global Health Network, and we are your hosts for today. So I am very privileged 
to have this opportunity to thank you and to welcome you all to today's discussion. Before we jump into today's topic, I'd like to provide you with a brief overview on the Global Health Network Africa for those who may not be familiar already. So I'll ask my colleague uh, Louis if you could please share slides. There we go. Thank you, Louis. Um, and thank you everyone for your patience. I hope you've had you've taken the few minutes to introduce yourself on your chat on the chat. It would be great to know more of you um, and form a network simply from this call. So the Global Health Network was first formed in East Africa, as a matter of fact, in Kenya a little over a decade ago, on the back of the grippling inequity in health research that was so evident in Africa at the time, and in some ways even today. And so it was formed to promote equity in where research happens, who leads it, and importantly, who benefits from it. And we do this through um, equipping teams and individuals with research and data science skills to enable them to engage and undertake in high quality research wherever they may be in the world. And as a result, we are able to support evidence-based um, decision-making. Since its inception, the Global Health Network has grown to become this vast and global um, and highly active community that is composed of healthcare workers, research teams, health organizations, and we are continuing to powerfully transfer know-how between diseases, uh, regions, and even types of research to develop skills and methods that make research leadership both accessible and feasible. And because of our unique strategy of knowledge mobilization, we have recently received the distinction of being designated a WHO Collaborating Center. And this is on the basis of our work with the Science Division of WHO and the mission, which is similar to ours, which is to enable research in every healthcare setting and to connect research with public health, ensuring that research is appropriate is locally driven um, and is also importantly addressing local priorities and that the findings that are produced can actually be taken up to deliver change. So the Global Health Network exists within a decentralized franchise organization, and we have coordination centers in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, um, and are soon launching in the MENA region as well. Our community has developed a portfolio of research enabling methods and processes over the many years that we've been in existence. And we work in partnership with existing networks, including PAHO, um, WHO, EDCTP in Africa, CDC, which some of you may be familiar with. And we're continuing to grow through our country-led hubs um, across the global south and are continuing to scale up and build communities of practice um, to facilitate connection, as well as to make sure that we are device diversifying our mechanisms and our teams um, further. In Africa, we exist and we work through interconnected network of regional centers with partners, including Africa CDC and AMREF. And we also work with country centers, including Malawi, Ghana, Sudan, and of course, Nigeria, which we will be talking to you a little more about towards the end of our time together today. So as I mentioned, we exist to connect excellence, to share knowledge and to foster exchanges that accelerate research evidence and to help us develop lasting, capable and independent research teams. Um, and so we also have a sophisticated digital platform and it's made up of over 60 knowledge hubs that cover diverse topics, including, of course, AMR, which we're discussing today, infectious disease outbreaks, data science. We've recently also um, got into the space of AI for global health together with other communities, as well as research ethics. And on this platform that is operated online, we offer freely available certified courses to help you develop skills in the various research topics, as well as importantly, an area that has come up, especially um, from colleagues in Africa, of wanting to build up the capacity in, which is data science. And all you have to do is simply create a profile, choose your course of interest, study the material that is readily available for you, undertake a short quiz or examination, and after successfully completing the examination, you receive a certificate. So this is my final slide, and I'm just going to use it to highlight that even as we continue to create equity and access to research skills and knowledge, our community has now grown over to over 
700,000 registered members, and we have de uh, delivered free training courses to over 3.5 million healthcare workers, laboratory staff, and even research teams, and over 150,000 researchers, particularly from low- and middle-income countries, have had the opportunity to attend a global health network event, whether that be a workshop or a research clinic. We also continue to provide hundreds of thousands of research protocols, templates, and guidance documents that continue to be downloaded and used and are freely available for all of us who may be interested on the call as well. And each one of these actually represents either an individual or a research team who has taken a step uh, towards planning or simplifying and delivering or reporting their research study to a higher quality and each represents a step towards more equitable health research systems. And so if this is a step you endeavor to take yourself to improve your skills and know-how in the area of research, simply head on over to our website or search the Global Health Network for more on this. So once again, I thank you all for joining us today and I welcome you to celebrate with us this year's AMR Awareness Week. And with that, I hand it back to our chair, Godwin. Back to you, Godwin. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh... As that, that was a very excellent brief um, introduction about the uh, Global Health Network Africa region. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who are just joining us, you're welcome to the Antimicrobial Resistance Symposium of the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center and the Global Health Network General. Of course, uh, as Christine said, they're looking at you know launching officially the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center. But given the fact that this event, the World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week, is an annual event. We cannot but jump in as quickly as possible to put this event up so that we can have intelligent conversation as to how we can collectively um, preserve our future together in using antimicrobials prudently in various settings. I have on the call, not on the panel, my colleague who happened to be the coordinator of the Global Health Network Nigeria country center, Dr. Ola Ibibami, who is currently in Austria for a conference. I, I don't know, Louis, if it is possible for you to unmute him, for him to say hello to us, then we jump in to bring um, Dr. Ryan Walker, coordinator of the Antimicrobial Resistance Knowledge Hub of the Global Health Network, to give us a quick insight on what the AMR Knowledge Hub is all about. Louis, can you bring Dr. Ola Ibibami on board? Okay. Um, we're just having a tea break now. I just want to wish everyone well and then I hope you enjoy the entire program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we we'll move on quickly to Dr. Ryan Walker. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to bring to the fore the coordinator of the Antimicrobial Resistance Knowledge Hub of the Global Health Network. Dr. Ryan Walker for a brief overview on what the AMR Knowledge Hub is all about. Over to you, Dr. Ryan. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for that incredibly generous introduction, Ohemu. And also, Christine, thank you for that fantastic presentation as well. So as Ohemu has mentioned, my name is Ryan Walker. I, I have a number of roles at the Global Health Network, but one of my core focuses is as a coordinator of the AMR Hub and Associated Community of Practice. Um, I just want to say that it's a pleasure to be here today on this meeting. It's absolutely fantastic. And my heartiest congratulations go to the TGHN Nigeria team for the incredible work that they've done in uh, forming this group and taking this community forwards. And I also think, obviously, from a personal point of view, it's incredibly exciting that we've taken this opportunity to launch uh, TGHN Nigeria alongside this focus on AMR. And I think it reflects a real commitment from the TJHN Nigeria team to tackling this threat that we all know is such a growing concern in the space of global health at the moment. I'm just gonna share my screen and I'll give a very quick overview of uh, the Global Health Network's AMR hub and our general uh, AMR activities. Uh, Henry, can you see my uh, slides? Yes, I can. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, as Christine alluded to, the Global Health Network is made up of this collection of various different knowledge hubs, each focusing on a different area of scientific discipline, perhaps disease focus, perhaps research group focus, or perhaps methodology focused as well. The AMR hub makes up a constituent uh, member hub of these 60 or so uh, scientific communities of practice that we have upon the Global Health Network. 
Uh, the hub itself was launched in 2021, so it's a relatively new hub. But uh, as you can see from our membership numbers on the right hand side there, it's an incredibly popular one. Um, these figures were taken from June this year. So you see nearly nine and a half thousand members. And it's almost certain that we have over 10,000 members globally uh, as a, a participants of the AMR community uh, on the TJHN space. On the left hand side, you can see an overview of where a lot of this membership is from. You see quite strong membership from uh, the global north. So for example, the states and the UK. But also, if you look at the global South involvement, you see a strong involvement from, for example, Asia, India, China, but also good involvement and participation from uh, East Africa and West Africa. You can see Nigeria highlighted as a hotspot there as well. So particularly if we focus on the African continent, you can see uh, in the bottom right, these top 10 LMICs, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, Tanzania, Malawi, South Africa, all highly represented in the membership of this uh, hub space. Um, a little bit about what we do as part of the uh, the AMR initiatives at the Global Health Network. Um, as the, the digital platform, the website that we have on the Global Health Network, it provides this dedicated platform to disseminate and support uh, partner resources and partner training material related to AMR research and AMR activities globally. Essentially, we aim to provide a sort of one-stop shop, if, if, you will, uh, if you will, for AMR research globally and include any free or open access learning and training materials for AMR researchers in one place and highlight them and, and divide them according to research area, the research theme, and even geographic focus so that they're easily navigable and accessible. Um, in addition to sharing existing resources, we also support and lead the development of uh, new resources, novel tools. Um, a core example of this is our regional AMR National Action Plan maps, which is led by my colleague Ahemu. These are really fantastic resources. And what we do is we look to identify uh, countries that, first of all, have exist existing AMR National Action Plans, which is most countries globally now. But then in order to make them accessible, you can see an example of the, the Africa map on the left hand side here. Uh, we, we pin the countries where those uh, resources are available and then link directly to them. So if you're wanting to review different national region or uh, globally, you can go to this tool, you can click on the different pins and you can easily access those plans. Um, we also continue to expand our collaborative network. So we have a lot of partners that we work with in the hub in terms of resource sharing and resource development. Uh, on the left-hand side, a key uh, group that we've been working with recently, of course, is the World Health Organization. Many of you will be aware of their uh, aware their Access, Watch, and Reserve book and system for the classification of antibiotics, um, which is an absolutely fantastic tool. Um, and we went through the process of working with Mike Charlotte and his team to develop an easily sort of navigable web space for sharing all of that enormous amount of information that's in the Aware book. I do encourage you, if you have time, to go to our AMR hub and, and navigate through this aware space because it really is a fantastic digital resource that the team, particularly at AMO, uh, have done an amazing job of uh, making more digestible and accessible online. Uh, as in part of our sort of resource identification activities, we do a bi weekly scoping and relevant literature, training resources, funding calls, uh, research opportunities, grant opportunities, that sort of thing. And we also host, um, first of all, digital events like this. So webinars, workshops, symposiums, that sort of thing, but in-person events as well. And I'm gonna give a quick overview of one of those uh, in a second. What I would like to take the opportunity to mention is, whilst we do our bi-weekly sort of scoping of uh, online accessible materials, the best way for us to identify really fantastic resources to share with other AMR researchers is through webinars and through discussions with members of this AMR community, like the people like yourselves that we have on this call today. So I would encourage you, if you have any relevant training materials, recent publications, guidelines, SOPs related to AMR research, and you would like to share those with other researchers, please do get in touch with us or potentially drop a link in the chat and we'll be happy to share those materials on the AMR space. As I mentioned, uh, this AMR symposium that we, that we hosted uh, nearly a year ago now in Cape Town prior to the Global Conference was really a sort of flagship example of a in-person event uh, and a demonstration of the power of the AMR network that we have as well. Um, it was focused on tackling AMR through a One Health approach, a One Health perspective. 
And you can see uh, on the right hand side, we had 155 participants from 29 countries and really, really strong African involvement in that uh, symposium as well. The vast majority of participants were based in LMICs and a diverse range of backgrounds, skills and experience was represented. So we had people from the academic sector, from the pharmaceutical industry, healthcare prof professionals, regulators and people from ministries of health, and also very importantly, people from the animal health and environmental health sector as well, reflecting the, the focus on, on the One Health approach. It was a fantastic day. We had a morning of presentation sessions, and this was followed by some really, really engaged interactive breakout sessions afterwards as well. Um, just a couple of uh, points on our future plans for the AMR Hub and where we're hoping to take things going forwards. We're always looking to expand the targeted development of e-learning and training materials. And a lot of the feedback that we get from our members in terms of what's most valuable for them is access to free accessible online training courses. So through collaboration with other groups and through the Global Health ne Network's excellent training team, we want to develop targeted, dedicated AMR e-learning that we can share with our members. Um, we want to increase the engagement in the Knowledge Hub activities from that community of, of 10,000 people behind this Knowledge Hub. And we've begun the process of this through what we're calling regional meet and greet uh, sessions via a resource that we have called our Collaborator Map. Uh, what we're hoping to do over the next few weeks is launch a series of working groups that have come out of some discussions that we've been having with our members, focused on uh, addressing particular research themes within the wider space of AMR, and hopefully look to put in some collaborative grant proposals to address those as well. So again, I encourage anyone that's interested in these particular uh, themes or in getting involved in some research to stay in touch with the Global Health Network, and we'll keep you updated on this process as we go forwards. Um, of course, this is a, a massive enterprise. There is so much in terms of AMR research. It's such a broad field. It's such a broad um, uh, uh, discipline. And so whilst we do our best to keep on top of it, we also know that uh, we need to invite as much involvement as we can from that community to make sure that we have the most relevant and the most um, uh, accessible range of AMR resources as well. So if there's anyone on this call that's interested in developing particular content for the AMR Hub, for example, in perhaps writing an article or a blog post on a particular area of AMR research, we would absolutely welcome that involvement in the Hub too. And of course, we want to take a more proactive approach to sharing things like funding opportunities and existing grant opportunities with our uh, community members as well. So sort of blurring those boundaries at the moment that we have as a sort of digital uh, community and making it a much more inclusive and engaged network too. Uh, we're also always thinking of new events. Again, a, a virtual events like this are fantastic. And as I say, Hamu's done a wonderful job of pulling this all together. Um, but we're also considering repeat in-person events as well. So potentially a symposium in the coming year. Um, just a quick mention of some of the current collaborators that we work with. So we're working with the British Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, focused on the development of targeted e-learning and training materials. So hitting that uh, previous objective that I mentioned in the previous slide. I've mentioned our collaboration with the WHO and the dissemination and promotion of their aware book uh, materials and information. Uh, we're working with uh, the AMR Data to Inform Local Action Group based at St. George's University in London, uh, and developing training materials based on some of the, uh, the information and the training that they have to share on the AMR Hub. And also an example of a group that uh, we're hoping to work with more in the future and we've had some contact with is the Nyanza Reproductive Health Society based in Kenya. And our aim is to create a dedicated uh, space for resources related to AMR in sexually transmitted infections on the AMR Hub as well. So Ahemo, I think that's my final slide. I appreciate that's a very quick overview of what we do in AMR, um, but back to you, Ahemo. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Brian. Uh, it's been wonderful, really, really wonderful uh, having you um, join us on this call and, you know, to tell us more about the Antimicrobial Resistance Knowledge Hub of the Global Health Network. We are super duper excited that you could make it. So ladies and gentlemen, we have to make progress. We are already beginning to get pressed for time. I must do my best to make sure that we keep to the time allotted for this um, symposium. The theme of this symposium, as you saw on the designs, is combating AMR, a collaboratory approach for a resilient future. So we have two excellent resource persons that have been carefully selected to bless us um, on their wealth of knowledge. And it is my honor to introduce the first speaker of today to us, 
who is going to be speaking to us on a very, very important subject matter. So our first speaker for today um, is a highly accomplished professional in veterinary epidemiology and preventive medicine. He earned his PhD from the University of Nigeria in Suka in Enugu States. His groundbreaking research on the molecular epidemiology of extended spectrum beta lactamase producing enterobacteria in food animals and humans in contact in Southeast Nigeria underscores his unwavering commitment to advancing public health. Currently, our first speaker for today serves as the antimicrobial resistance program manager at the Drasa Health Trust in Lagos, Nigeria. He plays a pivotal role in Drasa's antimicrobial resistance program, significantly influencing the development of Nigeria's One Health AMR National Action Plan 2.0. Our first speaker for today has demonstrated considerable expertise as a dedicated lecturer at the Ebony State University, where he impacts knowledge and guides research in animal health and reproduction. His commitment to ongoing education is evident through various qualifications, including a diploma in One Health Antimicrobial Resistance from the Mirrors Foundation and certificate from a renowned global institution. His primary research focus lies in applying One Health principles to comprehend the epidemiology of antimicrobial resistance genes in enterobacteria and zoonotic diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me and make welcome Dr. Solomon Olabi Olon Lake as he makes his presentation. Dr. Solomon, over to you. Oh, okay, thank you very much, Godwin. Um, it's nice being here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the globe. Um, so I will just go ahead and quickly share my screen. So my name is Solomon, as I've been introduced, um, and I work with um, the Drasa Health Trust. So the Drasa Health Trust is um, a nonprofit organization um, developing um, a network of health champions um, who care for their health and also the health of others who are around them and while actively, of course, um, participating in solving public health um, um, problems, um, challenges and preventing uh, the spread of disease. So Drasa Health Trust um, was actually founded or established um, after Dr. Um, Ameyo Stella Dadevo, who identified the first case of um, Ebola in Nigeria and um, contained it. Um, that's preventing um, um, a, a, an epidemic that would have happened in Nigeria. But unfortunately, um, she lost her life in the process. So um, I will just be speaking um, briefly on promoting uh, public awareness and education um, on responsible antimicrobial use or antibiotics use. Um, so um, just as a means of introduction, um, I want to say that uh, the outline uh, will go through the introductory part of it. Then we look at antibiotic stewardship and then factors contributing to high use of antibiotics in humans and animals. And then we'll also look at the need to herald public awareness and education on responsible antibiotics use. And then of course, the awareness um, and education str educational strategies to promote um, responsible use of um, antibiotics. So before we go into the meat of today, um, I would just like to briefly um, do some definition. So antibiotics, as we all know, are substance, um, substances that are produced by or derived, uh, which of course can be chemically produced from a microorganism that selectively destroys or inhibits the growth of um, other microorganisms. So, and then when we talk about responsible use of antibiotics, so um, what comes into our mind is the use which benefits the patient while at the same time minimizes the probability of adverse effect and emergence or spread of um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, okay, so um, it, it is generally known that responsible use of antibiotics, of course, uh, um, insinuates um, antibiotic stewardship. So um, antibiotic stewardship, uh, usually I, I love to say, uh, looking at the AWEVA, so it's the five R's. So um, 
the responsible use of antibiotics in humans, um, obviously, uh, uh, the wonderful classification, um, Ryan also spoke about this, the wonderful classification of um, or categorization of antibiotics that have been done by WHO is quite helpful, um, looking at antibiotics that um, should, we should have that should have access, and then those that should be watched, and then of course those that should be reserved. Um, this classification has actually helped um, in in giving um, a chat way or framework towards how we can reduce the um, irrational or misuse of um, antimicrobials uh, or antibiotics. So um, of course there was this um, goal that was set that by the end of year 2023, that um, about 60% of prescriptions should actually come from the access group. And this is just in a way to slow down antimicrobial resistance. And then there is no way obviously we can talk about um, antibiotic stewardship that will not delve into behavioral change and interventions. Of course, um, there are a lot of things that we'll be discussing as we progress in this conversation on uh, behavioral change and interventions, which uh, of course are key as far as um, we know that we want to change um, the attitude of people about the misuse of antimicrobials. And then of course, um, if we want to stick more to antibiotic stewardship, then uh, infection prevention and control um, of uh, must must be implemented. So infection prevention control measures are quite key. So these are the angles that we'll be talking about um, along the line um, as we look at how to channel or develop um, promotion framework improve the responsible use of um, antimicrobials in humans. Then obviously, uh, if we're talking about antimicrobial stewardship, we cannot just restrict ourselves to humans because we know that um, almost 70% uh, of antibiotics produced are actually consumed in animals. So we come up with the five R's, which is um, talking about the responsibility. So uh, to, improve antibiotic stewardship, especially in the animal health sector, we must obviously understand who is responsible for what. So who is responsible for prescribing the drugs, who is responsible for maintaining withdrawal periods, uh, who is responsible for ascertaining the dosage. So all of these are things that must be accounted for if we're looking at antibiotic stewardship, especially in the animals. And then obviously we are building focus on reducing the use of antimicrobials, especially in, um, in animals. Uh, Dr. Seniat will be speaking more about this um, in the next presentation. So we also need to refine what is given. So we, not, we obviously know that not all conditions are to be treated with antibiotics, especially in animals. So sometimes just managerial um, modifications can actually resolve some of the problems that um, antibiotics are used. And then, of course, we need to also consider what to replace and then how to review the antimicrobials that are used. Most importantly, biosecurity is also key, which is um, the prototype of um, IPC, infection prevention and control measures in human. So what are the factors that contribute to um, the high use of antibiotics in human. Uh, there are quite uh, a number of several publications. So my focus is actually going to lie in Nigeria. Um, so I'll be discussing more about things happening in Nigeria. So um, there are quite a number of publications that have been um, that have been in the public space about things that people do that actually uh, make them um, take more of antibiotics. And then of course, the first is, um, uncocktailed um, access to antibiotics. So most of the antibiotics are over-the-counter um, antibiotics in Nigeria. So it's quite a number of persons have access to any antibiotics without restrictions. And then of course, though there are regulatory policies, but obviously there are there are poor enforcement of these regulatory policies. And then of course, uh, poor infection control practices. Uh, the more um, infections we have, the more antibiotics are used. And then lack of treatment guidelines or where they exist, poor prescribers compliance. We have seen this um, 
replicating itself over the time, though there are policies that are currently um, under review and their policies already um, been enacted. And we hope they can be strengthened to actually reduce uh, the high antibiotic use, especially in human. Then of course, sometimes we have patient pressure. Uh, patients will literally tell their physicians that I want this antibiotics, it worked the last, last time, so uh, I still want the same prescribed. And then, of course, uh, th this, this is common. We have pharmaceutical companies putting pressures on physicians. So when they have new brand of antibiotics, sometimes they incentivize the physicians and putting pressure on them to prescribe those antibiotics. So um, obviously, we also need to look at that in animals because we're looking at a One Health approach. So what are the factors in um that contributes to um, high antibiotics use in animals. Of course, over-the-counter availability, and most of this <laughs> over-the-counter um, antibiotics comes a cocktail. Yeah, we call them cocktails because you have some of these antibiotics um, um, sachets or packages coming uh, um, with four or five different antibiotics in combination. So all of this actually, um, increases the particular content of antibiotics being used. Then of course, lack of knowledge and awareness. So we have mostly among poultry farmers, we have them um, using lots of antimicrobials for literally every condition they see. So, and then of course, uh, we have high disease burden, especially in low and medium income countries like Nigeria also, and this obviously leads to the use of more antibiotics, especially in animals. So poor biosecurity is also a key factor. Um, housing and feeding quality um, could also be um, a factor. Uh, and then, of course, lack of sufficient veterinary services. Yeah, we have quite a number of veterinary services um, activities going on but um, they, they are literally limited to urban areas. So we have them at the, at the national level, but at the subnational levels, and then in local governments, we have some of these restrictions, and then the farmers just resolve to whatever is available. And then, of course, poor enforcement of, uh, of, of, of regulations. So this is common. And then uh, lack of surveillance. So because we don't have surveillance data, we may not be able to to really uh, pinpoint evidence-based data that can actually inform the information that are passed across. Now, why is it important to urgently herald public awareness and education on responsible antimicrobial use in Nigeria? So I'm going to just um, bring out a few extracts from our research in the southeastern part of Nigeria. Um, but before then, antimicrobial resistance, of course, is um, an increasingly serious global threat uh, to the public health. And of course, it has been referred to as a silent pandemic. And so if nothing is done, uh, obviously, there will be more that um, as um, predicted by O'Neill. Uh, but uh, the Lancet publication actually revealed that about 1.27 million human deaths are accredited to AMR as at 2019. And the death toll, obviously, as O'Neill has projected, we increased to 10 million deaths um, by the year 2050. And the um, very striking and fearful thing about um, this number of deaths is high, the highest proportion of the estimated number of deaths, uh, of course, will be recorded in low and medium income countries because um, some of these um, preventable infectious diseases um, are prevalent in these countries. Okay, so, and then it's also important to note that the continuous interaction between humans and animals may predicate the spread and persistence of AMR genes among food animals and then in contact humans, especially in the Southeast. And so we have quite a number of publications, but these are just extracts of a few that will shown the relationship between um, uh, AMR genes in, in um, Escherichia coli from humans and from, from livestock and the relationships, and then saying how um, these genes move from humans to animals or vice versa. So the research we did, I'll just quickly run through this, just to give us an idea why it's important to herald um, uh, this awareness campaign. Now, uh, 
in the southeastern part of Nigeria. So we actually pick samples from all of the southeastern states. And then um, we looked at the prevalence of kefotaxim resistant um, enterobacteriaceae. And then it was quite striking that the, the prevalence was actually um, above 70%. And it, it was quite fearful. And then we did a choropleth map to just show how this uh, prevalence are spread in the southeastern part of Nigeria. And then we realized that states that are bordered, um, bounded by northern states, like for example, um, Anambra, Enugu, and Ebony states, um, actually had the highest um, prevalence of kefotaxim resistant um, enterobacteriaceae. And this is the reason why we have to herald um, uh, this awareness and an urgent need, uh, an urgent, um, is, is, is a matter of urgency that this should be done almost immediately. And then we looked at the um, antibiogram of this isolate. We picked just from, from three states and then we saw um, a striking resistance to different categories um, of um, of antibiotics, so um, we and we have quite high resistance to um, fluoroquinolones, to meropenem, to um, um, the the keflosporins, and it was quite something very fearful because this is um, from isolates from both human and and animals. So um, moving forward, we did whole genome sequencing, and then we obviously saw the presence of all of the AMR genes. And the AMR genes um, in different species of animals varied. But something striking is that in small ruminant, we have the isolate Xerichia coli from, um, from small ruminant harboring higher um, number of AMR genes. And it's quite... Um, striking that this is why we need to herald um, this awareness urgently. So these are just um, the distribution of all the genes that we identify who found aminoglycoside resistance, uh, beta lactamases, fluoroquinolone, tetracycline, um, sulfur metoxazole resistance, trimetoprene resistance, and phenicol resistance. And then importantly, uh, especially as it concerns IPC, we found prevalence to disinfectant resistance, uh, to disinfectants. And then uh, this disinfectant resistant genes that were identified, there were actually four different types of them. And the one that actually was striking was resistance to quaternary ammonium compounds. And these are compounds that predominantly used for cleaning surfaces and then cleaning hospitals, um, equipment and all of that. And now um, having resistance um, in E. coli that co-harbor um, um, ESBLs, um, uh, so it, it, it's quite a thing of, of concern. And that is why we need to herald um, this awareness. Now, we also saw the distribution in, in different species of animals and in human, and isolate from chicken harbored more disinfectant resistant genes. Okay, so to promote public awareness and education on responsible antibiotic use, of course, a One Health approach must be employed. And then what are the ways we want to go to discuss this? So we want to look at... Um, the first thing is to look at stakeholders mapping. So we cannot actually um, design an awareness campaign without actually identifying the target audience. So the first thing we need to do is to do a stakeholders mapping and then identify the stakeholders that we actually um, have high influence or low influence or high interest or low interest. And then by the time we'll uh, match all of this together, we'll be able to define our target audience. And then um, that will also help us to, to um, design our framework, our um, awareness framework that we can um, address the target persons we actually want to create this awareness among. 
So, um, of course, educational campaigns are quite important. Public awareness are important. Collaboration with um, healthcare professionals are important. And then, of course, online platform and apps, of course, are things that we could also engage in to create this awareness. Community workshops and seminars, just as we're having now, is quite very important to create awareness on the use, um, on the judicious use of antibiotics. And then, of course, we also currently um, felt bringing in celebrities and influencers to actually talk about the dangers of AMR, the grave consequences of um, indiscriminate use of um, antimicrobials or antibiotics uh, will go a long way to um, propagate this gospel. And then also it's important that we also have policy advocacy, um, especially with um, the strategic people that will actually push forward um, all of the regulations that can um, enact the responsible use of antibiotics. Then lastly, I actually intentionally place this lastly, is partnership with schools and university. Because at Drasa Health Trust, we have a school program. And uh, we actually target secondary schools. So in the past eight years, Adrasa um, has been doing a secondary school program and we call it, it starts with me. So it's actually an AMR uh, program uh, which we started um, in secondary schools. And this um, we did to, to bring uh, to these children um, the knowledge of AMR. And then we, we heard lots of things, lots of testimonies from them, especially about the, the mites and then the misconceptions about the use of, of antibiotics. I'll give you an example. For example, some of the girls um, or the female students uh, said when they have menstrual pain, they take uh, ciprofloxacillin, that um, that actually takes care of the, of the uh, menstrual pain. And of course, all of these misconceptions are the things that um, we've been able to correct during the school club programs that we started about eight years ago. And we, we, we did that in, in Lagos. And then um, with the help of WHO, we have been able to train about 1,400 ambassadors because one of our key major um, goal at Drasa Health Trust is to raise um, health champions. So we have about 1,400 ambassadors who are our health champions. And um, these are from 30 schools um, altogether, 20 in Lagos and 10 in Ocean State. But however, we have been able to reach out to about 28,590 um, students um, in the secondary schools. And then uh, of course that has also helped to increase um, the knowledge about the about antibiotics and resistance. And then this um this program have been extended to additional schools in Oshun State. And then um, in the in the next couple of years, we have the intention of um, um, spreading this this good news or this health hygiene clubs to all the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. I think I will have to stop here. I think this should be my last slide. Thank you very much. Over to you, um, God. Thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. That was an excellent presentation. It was mind blowing and I feel uh, I feel greatly enlightened um, listening to you sharing um, results of your research and how you've been able to create awareness, particularly the strategy that you guys are using in DRASA, are trying to engage secondary school students on how best to use antibiotics. And it is quite amazing to hear that young gears, you know, oftentimes um, take antibiotics whenever they have their, uh, um, the pain that come as a result of menstrual flu. That is a lot of abuse that you have there. I'm happy that you guys jumped in and you've been able to create a mind shift. And I believe these young girls in that locality, they are able to make informed decision and they are aware of when to and when not to use antibiotics. Thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. Um, uh, we have um, a couple of questions in the chat box for you. And uh, I'll just run through the few that I have so that you can take them quickly. The first person is asking, uh, that is uh, Martha, She's requesting that she need the references for the data that you presented. Perhaps she would like to reference you or quote um, those sources that you have presented in the course of your 
your presentation. You might choose to do this privately, or you can do um you can re respond to her request um via the chat. Then um a very nice question from uh, Malis Gani. If I didn't pronounce your name very well, I sincerely apologize. Thank you so much for an insightful presentation. To what extent do you think these AMR patterns you have highlighted is contributed by prescriptions of antibiotics by medical practitioners without the evidence from medical laboratories? For example, in Australia, all patients with clinical presentations of Neisseria gonorrhea have to be taken uh, have to uh, to be taking sample for culture before prescribing antibiotics. Do you think this kind of antimicrobial use awareness will help in reducing AMR? Uh, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um. So, in low and medium income countries where you don't have um adequate diagnostic facilities. Um, it, it may quite the the, the storyline may be quite different, so um, that is why we are raising all of this public awareness that uh, before the use of antimicrobials or the use of antibiotics is quite very important that um, a physician arrive at a at a um, confirmatory diagnosis. Um, but uh, where you have um, limited diagnostic facilities, it, it may quite be a little. Bit challenging um, because obviously uh, the, the physician is left to be under um, the pressure of the of the patient that please I'm dying I, I don't feel I feel unwell I need you to just prescribe um, a drug and all of that so this awareness that we're actually creating uh, though we don't have uh, I did not present any data from. Um, the human hospitals. So the data we have was data from the field. Okay, it was um, a survey data from the field, from human who comes in contact with um, animals, and then um, and then from the animals. So obviously, what what is available um, in what is available from the hospital setting or from the laboratory setting uh, may be quite different. But obviously there is a cross pollination at some point because um, this human also from the health facility also gets in contact with animals at some point. So um, that is why we are creating this awareness. So uh, we are making it public so that uh, those physicians and the public in general, or those in concern who prescribe antimicrobials or antibiotics will know that there is a grave danger already looming. And so with all of this evidence, they can now cautiously um, prescribe antibiotics or ensure that they arrive at a confirmatory diagnosis after laboratory confirmation uh, before prescribing um, antibiotics. Because what I know that is the general practice is um, prescribing um, broad spectrum antimicrobials. But I think it's important that um, we um, get those confirmatory diagnoses to uh, prescribe um, narrow spectrum antibiotics so we can preserve um, the broad spectrum antibiotics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. Uh, another question for you is, thank you so much for the educative presentation. Could you please uh, share your thought on what are, what could be the source of dis disinfectant resistant genes in animals? You work, okay. you are an infect doctor and you should be in the, of course, you're in the right position to give your counsel on it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so obviously, um, this this isolate that we worked on uh, are commensals. So um, in 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 Nigeria, for example, um, so disinfectant, especially during the COVID period, were were extensively used. Okay, um, and then obviously because of that extensive use, there will be some selective pressure, and then some of these bacteria develop resistant genes. So if this um, isolates uh, become resistant to some of these disinfectants, they get into the environment. And one way or the other, it gets to the animals. So uh, it may not necessarily be based on the disinfectant use in animals, but it may just be because um, there is um, a cross infection 
um, from humans to animals. And it's, it may also be that we have some of these, uh, especially in the poultry industry where you have food dips and then you use lots of disinfectants um, just for um, biosecurity. Uh, it's some of these pathogens could also develop um, the resistant um, genes to to this disinfectant, and so it's quite important that we. Uh, I think one of the things we were advocating for, which I've I've heralded, is when using disinfectant, please use the exact dosage the manufacturers prescribe dosing. Because most farmers underdose the disinfectants. And then sometimes uh, the, the manufacturer also give you contact time. And most individuals don't adhere to the contact time. And so with all of this, um, disinfectant resistance can actually develop. Yeah, thank you. All right. So uh, final question for you. Uh, I think I'll take this then. I just I think I saw one um, in the chat. For me to attend to your question, I really will appreciate it if you can put it in the Q&A box. So someone is asking, can we have honest press resistance? Is it possible for us to have resistance that, that, that is honest press? If yes, why and how? And that question is coming from Karimu. Yes, it's possible that you have some of these um, genes that are unexpressed. For example, um, you could have some of these genes present um, but they are chromosomal genes and then they are not expressed um, phenotypically. So, and then some of these genes, even though they are present, even though they are chromosomal mutations, um, they, they may not um, be expressed sometimes, but um, quite a number of those that are plasmid mediated um, genes are mostly um, expressed phenotypically. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so quickly to the chat box. Um, I think I have one from uh, Abdul Hakim. Okay, he's asking, was the why uh, the whole genome sequencing uh, of, of the isolate that you did was it done in Nigeria? And what platform did you use? Did you use Illumina or you use um, Oxford Oxford Nanopore? Then also he's wanting to know, do we have a biobank in Nigeria via the National Reference? Uh, via the National Re Reference Library at the NCDC, where resistant isolate are stored or their resistant genes compared with the work of other researchers in, in Nigeria. What's your thought on this, sir? Okay, so um, um, luckily, uh, my work was sponsored by the Commonwealth Scholarship. So it was actually done in the UK at the Animal and Plant Health Agency. So we use the Illumina platform. So um, for the whole genome sequencing. So um, the other part of your question, I may not be able to answer because I don't work at NCDC. So, uh, but I know currently um, DRASA, for example, is um, leading the, the development of the NAP 2.0. So, and I know during our conversations, during the workshops, we've been able to also identify that these are key things that should be done, especially under the surveillance pillar. So um, I, I know if it's not in existence, but I think it is, I, I'm not sure about that, but I know um, there are plans on the way, especially in the NAP 2.0, when it's been implemented to have that um, centered at um, the NCDC and the more la regional laboratories, um, we have all of this equipment um, to do um rapid diagnostic identification of AMR genes, and then also do molecular characterizations. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Solomon. Finally, I'm a scientist, Kulu, from Nigeria. What measures have you suggest, what measure uh, will you suggest on abuse of antibiotics, especially in the hospitals by prescribing physicians? Are we really treating based on international standard treatment guidelines? Do you think equipping the quality of medical laboratories, especially medical microbiology laboratories, and retaining of medical lab scientists will not reduce the rate of antimicrobial resistance? It's quite a combination of lots and lots of questions, but I would like you to just yeah. pick one of those and then you answer, then we'll move on to the second speaker for today. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. So my thoughts is... Uh, the, the like I said, that we need to move from just um, uh, subjective um, diagnosis, 
okay, to confirmatory diagnosis. And of course, if we have to do confirmatory diagnosis, the lab laboratories must be well equipped and then we must retain medical lab scientists. So if you recall, I said that um, to do all of this awareness and to stop AMR, we must um, holistically approach it. And that's the One Health approach. So if we're doing One Health approach, it means every hand must be on deck. Every discipline must come together to ensure that we fight this common goal or this common enemy called the AMR. So um, it's quite important that um, laboratories be equipped. And so the physicians can arrive at a confirmatory diagnosis based on the lab um, laboratory diagnosis. So if that is done, then obviously um, we are going to have less cases of um, antimicrobial resistance because sometimes um, an, uh, an antibiotics being used may not work. And then just using uh, another antibiotics based on antimicrobial susceptibility test result may actually help or um, identifying the genes that are present may also go a long way to help um, the physician to use the right antibiotics. Um, I think I'm going to move on to the next one that I have in the chat. So this person is asking, most of the time, empiric uh, therapy starts or prescribed, I think, prescribed after hospitalization or prior uh, to the report of culture and sensitivity. Does empiric therapy also help to increase antibiotic resistance? That's a question from uh, Rajan. Um, okay, so it um, depends on what the rationale of actually prescribing those empiric antibiotics in the first place. So um, the empiric antibiotics are actually safe. So we are not supposed to um, put a lot of emphasis on, on that. But if... Um, it's now being indiscriminately used. So the overuse of this empiric antibiotics, of course, can, can produce selective pressure. And this selective pressure, of course, heralds um, AMR. So, and that is what we don't want. So we're looking at an environment where um, we don't actually get to the point uh, that we have to use antibiotics, but we may not necessarily um, say we we may take off antibiotics, no, but we're currently looking at a, a scenario while we have alternatives to antimicrobials or antibiotics being used um, to actually improve the health of people instead of using um, empiric antibiotics. Yeah. Nice. So, so Dr. Solomon, uh, what other alternative do you find more or most preferable to antibiotics? Probably like bacterial fish, could you please give your suggestion on this? That's a question from Dr. Muhyiddin Olojo. I think I got the name right. Yeah, so uh, there are actually quite a number of um, practices ongoing. Um, we've heard quite a number of them, and they are also in the public domain. Um, the use of bacteriophages um, have been used over and over again um, as, as an alternative to use um, um, to the use of um, antibiotics. Um, and also, I, I know um, currently um, there are some practices, uh, like I heard more recently, um, there's a wing um, in, in the Federal Ministry of Health looking at the use of um, um, herbs. So now we now have um, the uh, herbal medicine um, gaining more ground or ethno medicine gaining more ground and quite a number of um, of uh, of resources have been actually invested uh, into looking at researches that will actually uh, bring about novelty in um, the use of alternatives to to antimicrobials uh, the, the unfortunate thing is um, over the years as now the, the antibiotic pipeline has slimmed down and we obviously don't have new antibiotics coming up anymore. So um, so I think looking into uh, the herbal medicine was actually an alternative that I saw Nigeria is actively um, getting engaged into to, um, to bring about uh, reducing um, the indiscriminate use of antimicrobials. 
Thank you. Uh, I think we have Dr. Seniat back on the call. Uh, yes. Louis, you help her with the screen. Uh, but before she she takes she takes on, uh, Dr. Solomon, one last question for you. Um, has there been antibiogram local data developed to improve empirical treatment in Nigeria? If yes, any suggestion to reproduce the same in other African regions? Uh, sorry, can you take that again? I just missed the first yeah. few months. Has, has there been antibiogram, antibiogram local data developed to improve empirical treatment in Nigeria? If yes, any suggestion to reproduce the same in other African regions? That's from okay. So, okay. So um currently, um I I I also got to know that of recent that we have a platform called called Amaris. And Amaris um, is a platform uh, putting together all of these AST data. And then um, we we have current, it's actually domiciled at the NCDC, Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And then um, we have um, a platform now trying to integrate um, the human data, data from the human sector, animal sector, and the environment into the AMRIS. So I think this is a platform that WHO also helped in facilitating. I think WOHA and, and WHO also um, helped in facilitating. And then this platform is currently gaining ground. And I think um, it's something that um, other African countries can imbibe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. That was an excellent presentation, very impactful and thorough. Uh, the work that you guys are doing at DRASA is quite amazing, and we are proud to read and to hear of your great impact, particularly um, educating on how best to use antimicrobials in various settings. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is the Antimicrobial Resistance um, Symposium of the Global Health Network, Nigeria Country Center, and the Global Health Network General. So it is my honor to introduce our second speaker for today to us. We have a lot of questions that have not been attended to. We hope that if we have spare time, uh, we'll be able to uh, ask the resource persons to lend their view on the question. So our next speaker for today is an environmental microbiologist and a senior lecturer at the Amadou Bello University in Zaria, Nigeria. She has a Bachelor of Science and a Master uh, of Science in Microbiology from the Amadou Bello University in Zaria. She also holds a Master's degree in Industrial and Commercial Biotechnology from Newcastle University, UK, and a PhD from the University of Birmingham, United Kingdom. She is an Arborada Cambridge Africa Fellow and currently involves in currently involved in AMR projects in collaboration with the Ineos Oxford Institute for Antimicrobial Resistance at the University of Oxford. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Seniat Afuba as she makes her presentation. Dr. Seniat, over to you. We really can't wait to hear your thoughts on subject matter assigned to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pius, for the kind introduction. I would like to share my slides. Um, if you can just confirm if you have. Yes, we can see your screen now. Just hit presentation mode and let's fly. OK. All right. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, good day to the panelists and everyone here. I would like to introduce myself again. I'm Dr. Senyat Afebwa from the Department of Microbiology. And um, I'd like to say well done to my co-presenter, uh, Dr. Solomon, because he has actually touched some of the aspects that I'm going to cover. So that's really nice introduction. Um, I have two little presenters with me, just in case you have my kids at the back background. Um, they might be chipping in one or two things. Thank you. My presentation is going to take this outline. So I'm going to give a little introduction. Uh, why do antibiotics work? Sources, uses, the gains, and the pains. Okay. So um, the title of the presentation, of course, was uh, Antibiotic Use in Livestock Farming, the Pains and the Gains. So what are antibiotics? Um, oftentimes, we find that antibiotics and antimicrobials are used interchangeably where antibiotics are actually antimicrobial substances that are active against bacteria. So you find that 
all antibiotics are antimicrobials, but not antimicrobials are actually antibiotics. And um, Dr. Suleiman already um, also discussed uh, that. So antibiotics are actually agents. So um, we might think that they're just um, recently known, but they've actually found traces of tetracycline in skeletons from ancient Sudan and ancient Rome. So antibiotics have actually been with us for quite some time. We are also aware of the records or the evidences that ancient Chinese uh, remedies involved the use of use of pastes, which were applied directly to wounds, and they cured them of those wounds. In the nineteen sorry, in the sixteen forties, um, in London, there was already knowledge that some molds could actually treat some infections. So antibiotics are actually quite ancient, uh, yeah. way beyond um, the time of Alexandra Fleming. And so the main big story you heard about antibiotics, when we talk about antibiotics, is about Alexandra Fleming in 1928, about penicillin. He discovered penicillin had um, an inhibitory property against uh, staphylococcus in uh, a laboratory medium. And that was where we, we began to hear more about antibiotics. This ushered in mass production of antibiotics and had different applications, even especially during the World War. So why do antibiotics work? So antibiotics, like we said, are active against bacteria. So they are selectively toxic for bacteria. So they bind to certain target molecules that are present on bacteria, but are absent in eukaryotic cells. So they are selectively toxic. Now, when they bind to this certain targets, they, it could be the cell wall, it could be the, um, um, they could target cell wall formation, they could target um, 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 protein synthesis and different targets. But once they do this, they inhibit the function of the cells. And if the cells cannot carry out this essential function, then they can't grow. And then this leads to inhibition of growth and or also leads to death. So antibiotics could be bacteriostatic or bactericidal and bactericidal. Where do we get antibiotics from? We can get antibiotics from natural sources, just as we had with the penicillin, which was gotten from uh, a microorganism, uh, penicillium, it could also have antibiotics that are semi-synthetic, so a modif chemically modified um, structure of what is naturally present, as we have in the case of amoxicillin. You also have the synthetic antibiotics, which are chem chemically synthesized, for example, um, the ciprofloxacin, and other antibiotics that are synthetic antibiotics or antibacterial agents. Yes, and um, since the time of Ander Alexandra Fleming's uh, discovery, um, antibiotics, like I mentioned, were used um, massively and there was a mass production. But the introduction of antibiotics in agriculture came in the 1940s, uh, specifically in 1948, where a company, Ledo, had a, a staff uh, by the name or scientist by the name um, Thomas Dukes who uh, found out that um, chickens that were receiving a supplement containing very low doses of antibiotics at the time grew bigger. And with this, they had bigger chickens and then they began to promote the use of antibiotics to sell, um, to sell chickens that would reach the market um, standard within a shorter period of time. So they promoted and promised faster growth, less disease and early marketability. And today, antibiotics are still very much in use. In fact, we have an increase in the use of antibiotics in livestock farming, especially now in low and middle income countries where there's a high demand for um, meat and other animal farm products. Uh, and so you have use of antibiotics in cattle rearing, sheep rearing, poultry farming, um, you name it, and on different scales. So whether it's a small scale or an intensive scale or large scale, antibiotics are used on the farms. So some, some stats that are quite glaring. So the, the global use of antimicrobial substances in, a, in animal production for food, so milk, meat, milk, eggs, or meat was um, about 63, over 63,000 in 2010. And this is projected to increase to over 105,000 in 2030. Now the global meat consumption is also projected to increase by about 14% in 2030. So with all this projection, it means that we're going to have more antibiotics being used in livestock farming because of the fact that we want more meat to meet, you need to meet the demand of um, the general public or the global meat demand and other demands for animal food products. So how are these antibiotics administered? 
Um, these antibiotics are majorly administered in the feeds of the animals. We also have them administered in their drinking water, and they could be administered as injections or as drugs. But the majority of the antibiotics get in as part of their feeds. And this is quite common practice in so many places, especially in our settings like uh, Nigeria and other middle, low and middle income countries. Now, antibiotic uses in livestock production. What are antibiotics really used for in livestock production? First, if an animal falls ill, the antibiotics will be used to treat the disease. Now, this might be whether or this might not necessarily be for treatment of bacterial infections. So you might have antibiotics used even for viral infections. Um, for example, when we went on the field to um, do a scoping exercise um, in northern part of Nigeria, uh, just uh, last month, there was this foot and mouth disease outbreak, and a lot of the cattle had not been vaccinated. So we found that the cattle rearers were administering antibiotics, even though your foot and mouth disease is a viral infection. So they had antibiotics administered to their cattle. So you can have antibiotics used for disease treatment if the animal falls ill, and this might be bacterial infection or non-bacterial infection. Now, to prevent illness in healthy animals when diseased animals are present. So usually when you have a farm that has a large um, number of animals, whether a large or a small number of animals, once there's a disease in one of the animals or an illness noticed by the farm manager or owner, the first thing they want to do is to prevent the illness from spreading to other animals. So for this reason, they use these antibiotics as a metaphylactic um, 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 approach to avoid disease from spreading to other animals. The third approach or the third use of antibiotics is to prevent disease in healthy animals when no animals actually display any sign of disease. So there could be an outbreak in another setting and they fear that their cattle or their animals could come down with the same um, disease. So they tend to use these antibiotics to prevent their animals from developing the infection. And then the fourth use of antibiotic in livestock production is to promote faster and more efficient livestock growth, just as we found with um, the, when we go back to the history of um, Thomas Dukes, when he found out that the animals grew bigger when they were given small or sub, sub, -therapeutical, so sub therapeutic doses of antibiotics. So what are the gains? What are the advantages of using antibiotics in livestock farming? The advantages include, one, you can prevent diseases on the farms. Two, growth promotion, because you have growth promotion going along with increased feed efficiency. So with a small amount of feed, the animals can put on more weight when antibiotics are included in the feed compared to when you have antibiotics not included in the feed. Now, antibiotics may reduce, so for this reason, antibiotics will result in less variability in the weight of the animals, and then they can also have some reproductive benefits for the animals. Now, for this reason, you can have a decrease in veterinary costs. Since you have disease prevention, there will be less veterinary costs. And then you can have also a lower amount spent on feed due to a greater feeding efficiency when antibiotics are included in the feeds. Now, um, producers tend to use these antibiotics for disease prevention. And if they use antibiotics for disease prevention, that means they spend less amount or less cost on biosecurity measures. So they lower the cost of biosecurity and then channel that cost into disease prevention. Now, they may also use less amount of space since they know that they are medicating the animals and giving them antibiotics to prevent diseases. So they have more animals within a smaller space or within a smaller pen or poultry house, for example. Since they are medicating the animals, they're going to use less antibiotics in the same um, space. Now for this purpose, you have antibiotics that are usually administered at sub-therapeutic levels, and then for, this can help to prevent diseases on the farms. Now, what are the pains? So we have spoken about the, the gains, which mainly revolve around the animals looking bigger, healthier, more meat, more eggs, more milk, um, generally more profits for the farmer. Okay. So what are the pains or what are the public health concerns of using antibiotics in livestock farming? 
So the first thing is that you could have antibiotic residues in the food. So because these antibiotics are used in large quantities or mainly overused due to poor um, administration or poor awareness on the impacts of antibiotic use. So you usually have antibiotic residues in foods and these have been found to cause some allergic reactions and digestive problems. For this reason, this was an early focus. This was a focus for the early regulation of antibiotics in food animals. And um, they had to be an establishment of a withdrawal period. So the time period between the last time the anti an antibiotic was administered to the slaughter time. But unfortunately, not many people, or most people do not comply with this. I would imagine um, this would be the scenario mainly in low and middle in income countries where there's very, very little awareness on the fact that there should be a withdrawal period after an antibiotic has been administered. Uh, the photo you see there was, um, it made headlines um, in India stating um, that you have antibiotics on your chicken or your meat. And they found that 40% of the samples had antibiotic um, residues on them. And they blamed this on the poultry farmers or the poultry owners administering antibiotics to their birds. and um, not knowing the implication of what um, this would do to the general public that feeds on them, and mainly focusing on disease prevention and growth promotion. So the second threat, which is why we're here, is the threat of drug-resistant bacteria, so antimicrobial resistance. There's been a lot of studies across uh, the globe about the appearance of drug-resistant bacteria in food animals shortly after antibiotics uh, have been used. The implication of this is that we are now having multi-drug resistant organisms that are originating from farms, originating from um, settings where antibiotics are used. So not just the farms, so even pharmaceutical companies uh, from the hospitals like um, Solomon mentioned in his presentation. And what this means is that these organisms do not um, remain on the farm. They have implications in terms of our human health. Uh, you're going to have higher morbidity, higher mortality, especially with the fact that we have um, very few antibiotics in the pipelines, and you have longer hospital stays, higher hosp hospital costs as well. So we have antimicrobial resistance across different, different farm animals or different animals. And like we already mentioned, there's over 75% of the annual antibiotic or antimicrobial consumption is um, in livestock farming or in agriculture. So there's a huge amount of antibiotic that goes into livestock farming. So you can imagine that livestock farming could be a main host, main hotspot for AMR. So it doesn't stay on the farm. Like I said, AMR gets disseminated. So for example, um, if you have your chicken being given um, antibiotics, either as a prophylactic, metaphylactic, or for disease treatment, the animal gets the antibiotic. Over time, organisms in the gut develop antibiotic resistance. Um, the anti uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria is released in their litter or in the dung or um, waste products that are released by the animals. These waste products usually tend to serve as a um, source of fertilizer or manure on various farms. So these are discharged to farms. Now, when these animals are slaughtered, you have this multi drug resistant organisms that are present on your meat. And when the meat is not properly handled, cooked, person handling it becomes infected with these drug resistant organisms, comes down with the infection, goes to the hospital, spreads these organisms to other patients as well as other, uh, as well as um, healthcare workers. And then the organism keeps spreading and spreading. And then we have issues of or we'll have to struggle with how to treat infections caused by these organisms. So AMR dissemination does not remain on the farms. So the routes of transmission to humans are mainly one contact with food that is contaminated, like we already said, then we have contact with resistant bacteria, where either the live farm animals, the manure, um, they could be shared in the, in the feathers, they could be present in their waste product, and so the main people at risk would be the poultry workers, the cattle herders. But when it comes to the handlers of um, meat, once it's been processed, so meat, those that are involved in meat processing could also be at risk. And then when it gets to the end of the food chain, then the person consuming the meat could also be at risk. 
and then like we already pointed out that an infected person could transmit the illness to other persons that are um, very close or in close contact with them. This could be other patients or doctors, like I mentioned before. So environmental contamination is a major problem as well. Um, so like we already mentioned, you could have this litter or waste from the farms that are directly discharged into the environment. Or you could have a situation whereby you have um, cattle that are roaming around. So because of their nomadic lifestyle, the cattle um, releases its um, dung directly to onto farms. There will be wash off, there will be runoff, and then washes down to drink different um, water, surface, so, uh, water sources, so including surface waters. Now, in certain communities or in certain um, um, countries, this surface water would serve as drinking water sources for some people on another side or in another part of the of the town or the community. So this could be a serious problem when you have indiscriminate indiscriminate discharge of poultry data or poultry waste. We also have the risk of dissemination of the antimicro uh, of antibiotic resistant bacteria by arthropods, especially flies. And uh, one of the studies or one of the projects that we were doing recently was to collect fly samples from, um, from um, poultry farms and then to check what antibiotic resistant genes they are carrying. We also collected fly samples from hospitals in Northern Nigeria, just to see what they were carrying within the hospitals. But we also wanted to see what flies within the poultry farms were carrying. Since we know that um, we could classify the um, livestock farms as hotspots for AMR dissemination. And so we have the problem now of um, limited antibiotics. We have, for example, there's an increasing reliance on polystine to treat some multidrug resistant gram-negative bacterial infections. Now, if polystine is still used on the farms, you would know that you're going to have the development or the emergence of polystine resistant um, bacteria. And this has been the case in different parts of the world. Um, for example, China has had to ban the use of polystine due to the emergence of polystine resistant um, bacteria. Now, unfortunately, polystine um, is still being used in certain farms or in animal uh, livestock, far in livestock farms in different parts of um, uh, the world, even though China has banned. And we've, we also found that China is actually exporting polystine to, to other countries for um, livestock um, farming. So limited antibiotics, and then this emphasizes the need for more antibiotics because we're having more drug resistant organisms emerging due to overuse of antibiotics. And we still need more antibiotics. Otherwise we'll be going back to the pre-antibiotic era. Okay, so what's the current situation? So the current situation we have is a lot of antibiotics are used in human and veterinary medicine. We have an overuse of antibiotics. And like I mentioned, the livestock farms are a major hotspot for AMR. Now, there are certain peculiarities with low and middle income countries because um, AMR is driven by multiple factors. We have already the infectious diseases to deal with. We have poor access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. We have poor antibiotic stewardship. Um, we also have the indiscriminate discharge of this effluent and waste into the environment. And we have the presence of uh, we have some antibiotics being used in low and middle income countries, which have been banned in other countries, and hence will drive resistance in low and middle income countries, considering the fact that there's a high demand for um, this product. And it's a global problem. So it's not just a low and middle income um, country problem. So I'll just round up. Um, so which outweighs the other, the pain or the gain? What do you think between the costs, benefits, um, bigger chicken, fatter chicken, um, more products, and AMR, um, taking us back to the pre-antibiotic era, um, increase in hospital stays, increase in hospital costs, what do we think? So I think that we have more of the pain uh, than the gain. So how do we manage the problem? How do we manage the problem? The problem has to be managed by collaborative efforts. Just as Solomon mentioned, there has to be a concerted approach it has to be collaboration with different stakeholders um, and this would be this has to be uh, an extensive collaboration so all hands have to, have to be on deck to 
address the problem. So this would involve one, the reduce of antibiotic use in um, livestock farming. We have the Scandinavian success story where we had fewer antibiotics leading to less AMR. So reducing antibiotic use would be very essential. Uh, AMR awareness is very, very key. And uh, I'd like to appreciate the Global Health Network for um, organizing this symposium to create more awareness. It's very important to create awareness on the threats that we face by overuse or indiscriminate use of antibiotics on livestock farms. And so we need more AMR research in livestock farms. There have been a number of surveillance studies. Um, there's need for more studies. Um, they found so many interesting research, so many interesting findings, um, but there will be need for more research. And this research will drive interventions. Or in the meantime, we can learn from other studies uh, what they have found and what we have found in certain parts of uh, Nigeria. And this, some of these were already highlighted by um, Dr. Sullivan. So other measures, so other measures I think that would need to be, um, to be implemented to help reduce the problem is to that vaccinate animals for diseases that can be prevented by vaccination instead of using antibiotics um, when um, you don't need antibiotics. For example, viral infections that do not need antibiotics. Subsidy by the government. I know, for example, the Nigerian government is not something that they would want to hear about uh, subsidies, but um, subsidy by the government might be um, helpful in vaccinating um, cattle and other animals and also to prevent um, the overuse of antibiotics. Um, biosafety, biosecurity um, measures, very important. Proper waste management would be very, very important. Otherwise, we, we, we will be um, contaminating our surface and groundwaters. Um, provision of veterinary support is also very important to avoid um, self-medication by farmers. And um, most, most um, people, as we know, most people just go and they get antibiotics mm -hmm. without um, proper diagnosis or prescription. So veterinary support would go a long way in helping. Government policies would be also useful, especially when it comes to banning the use of certain antibiotics on farms. At the moment, we just have a policy statement in Nigeria just stating that the use of antibiotics as good promoters is prohibited, but there is no ban. And then this is not uh, properly enforced. So um, there's less impact in this regard. So there are other alternatives to antibiotics, like we already mentioned, the use of vaccine, and there's more research on other alternatives, uh, bacteriophage therapy, predatory bacteria, quorum sensing, and the AMPs, and quite a number of alternatives that could be useful in reducing the use of antibiotics and um, ensuring that we still have good, um, good supply from, from the livestock farms. Okay, so summary, to summarize, I'll say antibiotics have existed for quite some time. They have different sources and different uses. While we have um, costs um, um, being reduced by the use of antibiotics, increase in the size of the animals, uh, prevention of disease and disease control, reduction of other costs, we also have to deal with the threat of AMR. We have to deal with um, other uh, public health concerns from the use of antibiotics, and which actually outweigh uh, the gains. Uh, there would be need for different collaborators to, to help in fighting AMR, especially in the use of um, antibiotics in livestock farms, and to make sure that um, other alternatives are being used and the use of antibiotics is being, um, is being um, monitored on the farms. So I would say thank you for this opportunity. And thank you to the organizers. Thank you very much, Dr. Seniat. It's been wonderful listening to you, um, sharing your thoughts with us on the subject matter of the use of antimicrobials or the use of antibiotics in livestock production and all of that. It's been lovely. Thank you so very much for as many persons who decided to uh, stay with us up until this very time. We are happy that the conversation actually went well and we are, you know, learning from the knowledge shared. Thank you so very much. So, Dr. Seniat, uh, I don't know if we can take more questions, but just one question from somebody, which I believe is very, very uh, 
important. And the question is, should farmers use antibiotics for prevention or treatment purpose? What is your take on this? Under 16 seconds, what will you say to Dr. Uh, to the anonymous person who is asking this critical question? I think um, it's very essential that um, the reason for the use of the antibiotic is known. So if an animal has an infection and um, you don't know what the infection is to start with and you begin to use antibiotics to treat, some of these antibiotics could be broad spectrum antibiotics um, that are being used. So to use for prevention or to treat, to treat is, is, is essential because you can't have your animals sick and then they are dying and you can't treat them. But if you have to use for prevention, then it has to be really, really um, controlled in the sense that you don't use just any antibiotic and um, there should be, there should be a, it should be well monitored the use of antibiotics on the farms. Right. Nice. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are we are almost close uh, uh, to the end of this webinar. Before we leave, we have just one item on our agenda for today that we haven't touched, and that is the announcement of the official launch of the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center. My colleague Louis, could you please permit me to share my screen? as I speak on behalf of the team, the excellent teams behind the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center. So ladies and gentlemen, for the past uh, 12 months, a theme of individuals have been working behind the scene with the Global Health Network in the University of Oxford. And the idea is to make sure that we have a center of the Global Health Network in Nigeria. And we are happy to inform you that the memorandum of understanding for the establishment of this country center was signed between the Obafemi Awolowo University and the Global Health Network in the University of Oxford. So we have the license, we have the permission to go ahead and swing into action operating um, to, to enable research in our own locality and to connect individuals with amazing opportunities that are bound in the area of global health research and all of that. So this is the uh, country center webpage. Lots of information have been added up at the moment, but just for your information, we have lots of amazing resources as announced by my colleague, Christine earlier on, who is the African Regional Coordinator for the Global Health Network. We have resources on several subject areas. You are free to click on any of them, and then you take a look at what you know is available. You can take these courses and you get um, accredited um, certificates from the Global Health Network on any subject area that you are interested in. We have a team of individuals who are currently coordinating this center. And we also have a team of excellent mentors, amazing individuals from the, from the academia in Nigeria who have, gener who have generously accepted to serve as the mentors of the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center. So we have a lot of information that we would love to share with you as part when we are going to launch. The date is yet to be fixed, but we are very, very hopeful that either before the end of the year 2023 or before uh, the end of January 2024, due information and due preparation should have been put in place. And we are going to communicate when the official launch of this country center is going to take place. And we really, really will be happy to have you on board so that you can benefit from the wonderful um, information and resources that we have to offer on the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center. So that is the, um, in a nutshell, the little information that we have for you as the announcement concerning the launch of the Global Health Network Nigeria Country Center. Uh, as we draw the curtain, I'm going to ask Dr. Solomon to give us his closing remark and then Dr. Zeniat, you also give us your closing remark. And I really would appreciate it if you can, in in a layman term, in a layman term, if you can just um, tell us you know, your advice for individuals who are yet to hear about antimicrobials and antibiotics and what you suggest that they should do so that they can use antibiotics prudently in their various settings. Over to you, 10 seconds, Dr. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much once again. Um, well, 
the the gospel i will call it the gospel so the gospel is to go out there and talk to people about amr the grave consequence of amr and that amr is a silent pandemic greater than uh greater than whatever infection you you could think greater than ebola and the rest of them and it's quite si silent because it's just happening and the, the number of deaths are increasing without anybody um really accruing those debts to AMR. So please, let's go out there and talk to people about AMR. And then one of the things that, um, that can actually increase AMR spread is the indiscriminate use of antimicrobials. Please, let's tell them to don't use antibiotics unless being prescribed by a competent physician. Thank you. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Suleiman. Dr. Senias, can you jump in real quick? Your closing thought? Um, so I would say that there's a need for proper use or um, proper use of antibiotics in uh, livestock farming. So we need to weigh between having just big chicken or um, preserving our own lives and avoiding AMR. So it's important that more awareness is created and um, responsible use of antibiotics should be ensured on farms and um, be careful handling your chicken and be careful also discharging um, waste from the poultry farm. So this, these are very important. So right, consider. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Seniat. Thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. All right, everybody, thank you so very much for and on behalf of every one of us at the Global Health Network and the Global Health Network Nigeria countries. Center. We are very, 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 very grateful to you for making our time and for staying with us this long. We took, we stayed longer than we planned, but it's all for good. I believe you've been challenged otherwise and mentally, and um, you use antimicrobials prudently in wherever you find find yourself. So we are very glad. We'll do our best to inform you as soon as the report of this webinar is available. All slides will be made available on the Global Health Network. Until we come your way again, I remain. Him, Godwin, Pius. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Thanks.